Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call to order this committee of the whole meeting of the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores and welcome everybody to the Council Chambers this evening. We're glad that you're here. First item is disclosures of pecuniary interest and nature thereof, and I'll ask any member if they have a, any pecuniary interest they'd like to declare. Councillor Smith. I have a pecuniary interest to item number 7.4, item 1, uh, Gord's Pro Shop and Imprints Lease Agreement. What's the nature of the pecuniary interest? Gord is my father. Thank you very much. That is noted. Any other declarations? Being none, uh, then we'll move on to no additions or deletions or amendments. So that takes us on to item four, which is the open forum. And we do have one open forum uh, uh, speaker this evening, and it's John Willits. Uh, and uh, he is here to talk to us about item 5.1, the delegation. So, uh, Mr. Willits. Come on up, uh, the podium is yours. Make sure to push the blue button there to have your mic. I want to make sure I position this correctly as well. Is that right? Yeah, that's good. Be heard. Oh, great. It's, uh, three you. minutes, Mr. Willits. Great. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is John Willits. I live at 159 South Rankin Street in the town of Southampton. Um, the Royal Canadian Legion here in Southampton sent a letter to the county expressing some interest in in. Uh, demands, but that's, I'm not here as the, the president of uh, the Legion here in Southampton. Uh, I'm here as a, a citizen and a, a volunteer at the Marine Heritage, uh, promoting our natural heritage and culture. I'm also here perhaps as uh, the fourth generation of, of, of builders and, uh, and renovators, and I've had an opportunity to work on homes as old as 1857 or somewhere around there because the records aren't really good then back there. I had an opportunity to go through this particular building, <clears throat> and I did it with a form very similar to what a home inspector would do. And I was very impressed with the original condition, quality, and character of the building. Uh, truly untouched with the large oak baseboards, the uh, oak uh, pocket doors sliding as they do. This building is, certainly does add architectural interest to this town. It contributes to the town, old town character. As a captain on the tour boat, at Marine Heritage, all summer long, we see residents and tourists marveling and admiring our character and our natural culture uh, and heritage. Uh, loss and further fragmentation uh, by the loss of this building would deplete the natural and historic character of our town, as it is done with many towns in southern Ontario. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Okay, so that then takes us on to uh, delegations, and we do have one delegation this evening, and it's from Mr. Charles Hazel, uh, and he's here to talk to us about 254 High Street. And, uh, of course, uh, all delegations are uh, 10 minutes, Mr. Hazel, so uh, we have your 10 minutes, and uh, if we happen to run up against that, I'll give you a gentle reminder and uh, ask you to wrap it up. But uh, after that, uh, the floor is yours. Thank Sir. you very much, uh, Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council, I uh, appreciate the opportunity. And uh, given the uh, time limit and the, uh, the uh, heads up, I'll jump right in. Um, there was a lot going on regarding the rectory manse building at the top of High Street, and we have a presentation here. Uh, where I know how to. Here. Um, at the, in reaction to efforts by the county to move the building first, and then lately to demolish, uh, to seek to demolish the building and clearing the site to enable redevelopment. Understandably, this has raised questions from the community and others as to the reasoning behind this. Just to recap, as it stands, the permit for demolishing has been issued and the tenants have left and the electric meter has been removed. Many people are tracking progress on this site because they enjoy the museum. They like the manse building for, what, uh, for the, the fine building that it is and they think it should play a role in the future of the site. They have done what citizens do elsewhere on matters dealing with heritage resources at risk they have expressed their concerns and taken action. Heritage matters for many reasons, some of which I will refer to this evening. Uh, by the way, I'm an architect and I have a specialty in heritage conservation and uh, I advise the City of Toronto on these issues and on many projects. Um, the subject is, of course, 254 High Street and why it should not be demolished and what we can do to stop it. What I'd like to do also is to uh, see if we can sway some of you good councillors on uh, supporting this, um, this taking place. First, I want to remind ourselves on the central place that heritage buildings have in our economy, our communities, and our future. And I won't go into the detail, but I will read just one piece, which is 
uh, sort of the third in, which is here. And it says that there are no, there's no form of economic development of any kind anywhere and on any level that is more effective and with greater leverage of scarce, resu- scarce public resources than preservation based on commercial revitalization uh, known as Main Street Preservation. So keeping this in, mind, this in mind and the building's location is important. In the long run, though, preservation's economic impact is far less important than its educational, environmental, cultural, aesthetic, and historic, uh, historic and social impact. So it has extraordinary effect on our community. Um, what I'm concerned about is that there has been um, not enough uh, that, that the basis for making decisions about this site have been uh, skipped uh, in terms of understanding them, and I would just, just encourage uh, council and others to reflect on that as they proceed to uh, tacitly or explicitly support the removal of this building. Um, first, I want to remind ourselves of the central place that heritage buildings have in our economy, uh, and I've just mentioned that. This is a quick look at the street uh, intersection, which uh, this building, the upper left-hand corner, is a part of, is a crucial part of. There are three, four buildings on that uh, on that corner. They've been there for over 100 years. They, in relation to the width of the street and the kind of clarity that it provides regarding the intersection as it divides institutional use from commercial use and creates a unique axis or counterpoint to the the um, flag at the other end of Main Street, this is a very, very important corner and should be and every building on it. All those four buildings have been put there for a reason. They've created patterns of use and expectation and they should be and must be preserved. So I'm just giving you some idea of what you already experience day to day, but um, there is nothing quite like it, and it relies on the persistence of those buildings. You have an opportunity now to expand the museum towards that corner. That opportunity carries with it a responsibility to acknowledge the significance of the building that's there as a crude value and uh, as a um, a point of reference for much larger context, which of course is the lake, the ferry lake, and the paths of travel around it. Anything you do must take this into consideration. And I ask you to consider uh, consider many things, but at least the significance of that intersection and the buildings on it. Then the views which are occur in relation to it uh, and the sight lines, all of which this is much too uh, fast to um, a presentation to explore, but they are there. They are crucial to understand in, in, in um, uh, bringing you to the point where you make a decision about demolishing that building or not. These are uh, images which you have many of which demonstrate the value of that building and the persistence of it in time, the, as, as has been mentioned, the extraordinary condition that it's in, and there's nothing, uh, there's nothing that can really replace it in terms of quality. The other aspect of it is, of course, how it uh, relates to views defining the intersection. I've provided two or three studies which of those views which add up to something that uh, involves landmark structures and views of the intersection. This is an anchor point for Main Street and must be preserved to function in that way. Taking out the manse risks everything, and uh, you, must keep that, you must keep that in mind as you make your decision. This is a site as it's been developed in the most recent uh, description of, uh, of where the archives will be. As you can see, there's absolutely nothing that uh, prohibits the manse from being uh, kept. Uh, in fact, the 6,000 square foot uh, or uh, on each floor uh, total, I think, 17,000 square foot archive fits neatly between the uh, museum building and the manse. There's absolutely no need to remove it. And in fact, I believe the, that was uh, kept in mind as the archive was, uh, was considered and uh, massed on the site. This is from a report uh, for 2018-2019. Next is the description of the plan for that archive. Keep in mind that the massing of the, or the programming of the uh, archive involves storage for approximately 50% of the area. This storage is massed on the uh, side of the street facing Victoria, uh, Victoria Street. It uh, forms a two-story high blank wall to the street. This is not the kind of building that should uh, be built there, quite frankly, in its current form. You should be reconsidering uh, the uh, location of your program and consider a basement. You should also look at the 
amount of storage that you're proposing, which projects to the year, uh, I believe, 2080 in terms of its needs, a time when there will be radically different ways of storing uh, archival material. Uh, furthermore, to take out the manse and exchange it for a blank wall on two sides is not a bargain that you want to be part of. So take a look at there's some suggestions here about what uh, action you could take to correct it. Uh, building an archive is a brilliant idea. Building that archive is not a good idea. And taking down the manse to facilitate what is a light industrial building is a very foolish uh, course of action. And I would really uh, 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 encourage you to think about that in relation to the effect that it will have for a community to see a backhoe uh, dig into this building and destroy it. That is, not, that is a cathartic action. You should, um, any city that goes through that is damaged, and to do it to a building of such quality is, uh, is uh, unforgivable, and you will have to reflect on that as you carry it with you for the rest of your term. Please don't do that. It's unnecessary, uh, irresponsible, and uh, you can do better. Uh, there, there are many uh, buildings in the world and in, in our cities that tr attempt to do better. Uh, these are some examples of projects in communities not unlike yours, where they have risen to the task. That's one I designed. And it was a mess, and, uh, an extraordinary mess, but the community said it's worth it and proceeded to make something quite remarkable out of it. Other buildings, uh, such as in Cambridge, uh, are uh, distinctive. Um, they have dynamics to them that are different, but in this case, that long bar is a public, uh, um, it's a public place of, uh, it's a library, a uh, digital library, and uh, with uh, magnificent views. Uh, the massing is particular to the site, but they kept the building that was there. They used that to, uh, to wrap around, and they have a very, uh, very they made a very important contribution to, uh, to the community. There are others which, are, uh, which will occur here in Southampton, which have to do with warehouse space. It's, it's fantastic uh, uh, adaptive reuse of them. It's a key to your success. Whether it's that one you just saw or smaller ones, these are all important projects. You have the makings of it here. You have the right culture of expectation here. Just fulfill that promise and you will, you will, you will distinguish yourselves. And of course, the work uh, is, uh, is a, uh, fosters uh, um, all sorts of community values and uh, trades uh, and activity. You become known for making good decisions using, uh, using uh, existing resources, building on your strengths and building the narrative about your community. What can you do? Um, there are many things that you do, many things you are doing. I'm just, I'm just saying don't lose track of it. Don't. Don't lose grip on these remarkable resources. Um, you know they're valuable. You know they can be adapted. Uh, to choose that direction rather than squandering these, uh, these resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hazel. Are there questions or comments from members of the committee? Councillor Rich. Uh, <clears throat> thank you through, through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Hazel. It was in, um, very good. Um, I just have two, two quick questions. Um, one is, um, it's, it's a Bruce County project. What, what would you like to see this council do? And then the, the second part of it is, um, if, there, if your suggestion carries an additional financial cost for um, building the archives that they want, how would you propose we pay for it? Well, the first thing is it's a civic project, and that whether it's Bruce County or it's municipality, it's the same thing you have a responsibility to make sure that projects of value occur in your community. And this is of, of exceptional value, exceptional site. You have the ability to, you have aligned official plans, which have much the same goals with respect to the, um, the uh, Heritage Act and obligations of municipalities to reflect that in their decision making. You are aligned with that. So the, you, you measure up to the same standards. In terms of what you can do, I suggest you do everything possible and necessary to stop this from proceeding. And you could begin by voting against the um, issuing of the demolition permit to create a pause, to reflect on the best use of that site, to reflect on the program, which is um, a very strange concoction and probably two th a third too large for what it should be doing. Think about the massing and uh, get on with the business of uh, developing design and uh, solutions that enhance that corner, build on the strengths. You, got, you have to become involved, is what I'm saying. And whether it's picking up the phone or deciding amongst yourselves over coffee that this isn't the right thing for the community, even in this 11th hour, you should be doing it. 
and the financial. Well, I, I, in terms of, in, could you uh, say the question again, please? So currently that project isn't costing us anything. Um, so if, if it was going to cost more money to keep the, to keep the manse? To keep the manse and to fix it up and, and do that, where would you propose we, we pay for that? Uh, you'll find the money. If you know how valuable it is, you'll find the money. You've got a building that is that is many times better than buildings that I save and municipalities decide to save. You have to find the logic, and it is, it, it's here in your community. It's embedded in it. It's why you saved the lighthouse. It's why you, you made an addition to the Carnegie Hall. It's all those things. You have that situation presented here. You must rise to the occasion. Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Charles, for your presentation. Um, I, if I may, I'd like to say a couple of things uh, just about the, uh, the idea, the future of the rectory. Um, since uh, Bruce Power announced back in mid-May that uh, this was their preferred site for the Nuclear Institute, um, I've spoken to a lot of people, um, a lot of people commented on this unsolicited when I was campaigning during the election uh, and have brought it to my attention through emails, phone calls, um, personal conversations, even a handwritten 10-page letter uh, that I got from somebody. Um, these people represented all walks of life uh, within our community, people who are, um, who've lived here all their lives, people who are seasonal residents. Um, I also heard from some people who um, said that they supported the Nuclear Institute in that location. But uh, as we know, in uh, the fall, Bruce Power announced that they were not, uh, uh, that they were withdrawing from that location at that time. And uh, just in the February 2019 marketplace issue, uh, Vice President James Skongak of Bruce Power said, uh, Bruce Power has decided to no longer pursue building the institute adjacent to the Bruce County Museum and Cultural Center, um, but we look forward to, uh, we, look, we continue to look for a site that allows us to fulfill our vision. And since Bruce Power made that announcement, I've received no one uh, telling me that uh, they support the removal of the rectory for the museum expansion project. Um, I looked back at the February 2017 feasibility study that was published by the county on the museum expansion, and um, on page 15 of that report, which was that particular section of the report was talking about the public consultation that was done during the feasibility study or in preparation of the feasibility study. Um, and one of the things that they talked about was that there was strong support for the preservation of heritage architecture with regard to this particular project. On page uh, 15, um, this is what the quotation is. With regard to heritage architecture versus new construction, to be used in the archives, optimum development model, almost every respondent stated that they greatly appreciated the mix of old and new building elements at the existing museum. Even though with those with concerns about the current layout say they would like some aspect of this combination to be maintained in the future. Uh, and uh, Charles, in his presentation, has provided some examples of melding, preserving the old, melding that with, with a new extension. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, as chair of the county's museum committee, I just wanted to, um, I've got a couple of quick questions. One is, um, I went back and looked at the January 24th county council agenda, uh, which was talking about the budget. Um, and one of the things that it said in there is that the funding of 1.16 million for the architectural plans for the project was removed from the county budget. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, and so um, 
we have, I think, a number of people in the in the uh, uh, audience tonight who are here uh, interested in this particular issue. Um, the most recent statements in the media by um, by you and by Warden Trollin are indicating that the county is still planning to proceed with the demolition of the rectory. Is that true? County uh, Museum Committee, as you know, gave directions or reported to this council back in January, gave direction to uh, remove the house from the property, uh, um, initially by attempting to sell it, and then uh, if that was not possible, to uh, demolish it. And that, that direction stands. As far as I know, uh, staff is proceeding along those, along that, with that direction, which uh, hasn't been changed. Okay. Um, so my question, I guess, would be since... Uh, the funding for the architectural plans uh, has, is not going ahead for this year, 2019. Um, and uh, since um, Bruce Power has made a public statement that it's no longer considering this site, um, is, is the County Council willing to consider some kind of architectural plan which would integrate uh, and preserve the rectory and integrate um, a new expanded uh, project, which is sort of a win-win in my mind. Thanks. So what we're going to be getting back, I mean, so what happened in the budget was the funding was, tax levy funding was removed. Uh, but also in the budget report, um, we heard from the director of the museum as well as the CAO that uh, we could expect a report back. Uh, with um, a path forward in terms of financing. Likely the way the county will finance construction there is through long-term debt uh, because it's a very large project, an $11.5 million project, possibly more. Uh, and so uh, I, it's beyond the means of the county to fund in a single year's tax levy anyway. So we're going to be getting a report, I suspect, uh, in the relatively uh, near term to tell us uh, how we're going to proceed. And I think that's going to include... Uh, and that's why it's important, I think, to talk about, um, you know, the the whole picture there. The uh, we need to the county needs to assess all of the range of uses that it's going to require on that site, uh, because um, an archive is probably not going to be enough at eleven and a half million dollars to justify folks spending folks my colleagues on on council spending that money. I myself would vote to spend the eleven and a half million dollars on the archives, but. I feel my colleagues probably would not uh, without us achieving more for the county than just that. So um, so that's why we need this report back to review what our options are going to be uh, and to what uses are going to be required on that site. But ultimately, uh, the county acquired the site uh, at a significant expense and uh, the intent is to convert it to public use um, through a new institutional development, which uh, I expect and, and which I have certainly said many times, I, um, my own view is that it needs to um, coordinate well with the surrounding institutional uses which already exist on that site. And there are many ways to achieve that, I think, uh, certainly in terms of the historical flavor on that site uh, and in that whole area, which uh, certainly no one would dispute exists. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, we have to look at, uh, we have to get this report back uh, before we can decide exactly uh, how that's going to look, but the intent of the county council, at least as currently stated, is to proceed with a redevelopment on that site. And I'd also add that with regard to the um, Bruce Power comment, which, uh, was, which was unfortunate, you know, in my view, uh, that, that that project wasn't, uh, or at least that, what that site was ultimately rejected um, by the county and by Bruce Power. We've been working on having conversations uh, with them uh, and with the county uh, from the town of Saugeen George perspective in terms of other sites that could be available or what sites could be made available uh, for that project. But, you know, I myself was deeply disappointed by the fact that the Nuclear Innovation Institute uh, was is no longer, I continue to be disappointed that it's no longer uh, being proposed for that site. Uh, and, uh, you know, my personal view, it was the best possible site for uh, for that uh, facility to be, and uh, it would be great, in my view, uh, if if Bruce Power would reconsider that site, uh, because uh, it certainly would be a great feature and a great uh, benefit.
to the town of Saugeen Shores, the town of Southampton, and to the entire county. But uh, anyway, just wanted to make that statement and follow up to that comment as well. Are there any, are there any other questions or comments from members? See any? So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hazel. We appreciate uh, your time. That moves us on in our agenda to item 7.4, and we have two reports of, from community services. One, the first one is a staff report on the renewal of Gord's Pro Shop and Imprints Lease Agreement and the Director of Community Services. Thank you. This evening I present to you uh, the extension of a three-year term for a lease agreement for space here at the Plex with uh, Gord's uh, Pro Shop and Imprints, and this is for skate sharpening services. And I've indicated in the report the revenue that we'll, we'll, we will be expecting in 2019. Thank you very much. So we have a recommendation, and I'll read it, and we'll take any questions or comments. It's recommended that Council pass a bylaw to authorize the lease agreement for Gord's Pro Shop and Imprints for a three-year term to end on December 31st, 2021. Questions or comments from members? Being none, all in favor? That's carried. We'll bring back Councillor Smith. Okay, that moves us on to the second staff report on the Chamber of Commerce lease agreement and the Director of Community Services. Yes, this is two lease agreements that we have with the Chamber of Commerce, and this is for uh, a lease agreements, both of them. The first one's at the Port Elgin location of the Chamber building, and the second one's for the Southampton Town Hall. And again, the report indicates the financial impact. So we have a recommendation that Council pass a bylaw to approve a five-year lease renewal with the Saugeen Shores Chamber of Commerce for the lease of, cha of the Chamber Building in Port Elgin, an office space located at the Southampton Town Hall, effective April 1, 2019, and expiring March 31, 2024. Questions or comments from members? Uh, starting with Councillor Schreider. Uh, thank you. Through you. Um not lo in related to the uh, staff report before and also this one, not looking to change anything, but do we do um, investigation or um, a little bit of research on regards to fair market value for the square footage for those types of locations, or are these just amounts that kind of roll over and then we increase uh, annually? Thank you. At one point prior to this report, there would have been a, a market research. Uh, there has not been as part of this one. This has been the typical economic adjustment increase for both of them. Council Rich. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Jane, is, it, is there going to be a, uh, there's a report coming out this year with regard to um, our service agreement with um, the Chamber of Commerce? Correct. Yeah, uh, so if, the, if there were any changes to that, which uh, that they would need more or less space, um, would, we be, would we have the flexibility to change the lease at that time? Um, not necessarily for the lease that the agreement that you're re referring to is our service agreement so that's the services that they're providing uh, we have met with the Chamber of Commerce uh, a number of times leading up to this at this point they haven't indicated an additional space is required right I guess I guess my concern is is that if we look as council um, at the service agreement and decide that we want to make we were kind of caught into a five-year lease we can make changes at that point um, with the Chamber if you know what I'm saying, right? Right. right. We, there will be an opportunity, if required, that we could go back and review this lease agreement, if required. At this point, we'd prefer not to. Councillor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Um, I recall, uh, I think it was two years ago, sitting on the Chamber Board, there were some anomalies with this lease, and I appreciate that it's been updated. Uh, and it looks very good. The one anomaly that was identified, and I think still is, I still don't get my head around, is the fact that the tenant shall be responsible for paying the property taxes under additional fees, Section 4. Um, I always thought this was strange. If you're a, a tenant 
I've been in the landlord tenant business for a long time. It's a strange thing that the tenant would be responsible for the taxes. And it's, it's doubly strange that being a municipally owned building that there would be uh, taxes charged on a municipal building. I, we don't pay taxes on this building, right? Because we, the town owns it, right? So that being a owned building, why is there taxes and, and why does the tenant have to pay for them? Because they're considered a business running out of the building. That's why. That's why it's taxable? Correct. Okay, and it, it just, it's customary that we charge tenants tax on buildings that we lease out? Um, if it's a business, yes, we would. All right, just, it's, it seems strange to me, and uh, I guess if that's, you're saying that's the way it is, because that's the way it is, then I'm going to take your word for it this time. Uh, for, yeah. Further questions or comments from members? I don't see any, so I'll ask all in favor of the recommendation. Opposed, if any? That's carried. Okay, so that takes us down to communications and petitions for information. And there's three items there. See any questions or comments on those? There is then uh, reports of municipal councillors and policy, and you'll see a report from myself there uh, with a few items. Of course, the document uh, isn't opening for me at the moment, but there's a few items there with regard to, I should remember it, I wrote it, the... Uh, um, the interesting one, I one I wanted to point out, which is is not, uh, it's been talked a little bit about in the media in the last number of days, but it's a really exciting project. This uh, this um, foundational hydrogen infrastructure project, uh, in cooperation with uh, the First Nations, we had uh, um, Chief Anaquat at uh, Bruce County Council uh, last week, uh, and um, it's a really great opportunity for us to work together uh, to uh, produce green. Uh, uh, power source in hydrogen, uh, huge opportunity for us to uh, turn our uh, status as a energy capital in Ontario into another huge industrial opportunity uh, and one that, that leverages the green economy as well. So it's just a really exciting project and I just wanted to write something to you about it because I thought you should know about it. And also the, the CNA uh, conference which we attended was uh, really a uh, positive uh, event and the thing that uh, we should always mention was mentioned by uh, um, Bruce Power officials there and it's true this whole this the the extent and range of the medical isotope um, uh, business that they're in and the end the the benefit to humanity that that provides is really hard to overstate they said the, the, the number they gave there and David will correct me if I'm wrong was some 400 billion syringes worldwide uh, are sterilized by those medical isotopes, of which about 40% of those isotopes are produced at Bruce Power. So you're, you know, you're talking 180 billion syringes uh, sterilized every year uh, because of work going on at, at Bruce Power. So I mean, that's the kind of impact that that, that facility and that this region has on on. I, I, no, it's not an overstatement to say on humanity. And that's uh, really something we should be proud of. Um, Anyway, uh, and I, I also included for you uh, a presentation, which I'm not going to give, uh, in case you were worried that that's what I was going to do. Uh, but just, uh, it's included there for your information. I am presenting it again tomorrow at the Chamber of Commerce. I'm going around and I thought you should have it just so you knew about it. So if there's no questions, for, oh, uh, Councillor Smith. Yes, and through you, Mayor, uh, thank you to those individuals from the Town of Saugeen Shores who represented us at the CNA conference uh, now a couple of weeks ago. I would just like to note that our neighboring community takes their role as host community to the world's largest nuclear operator very seriously. And going forward, I would love to see our council play a more active role in the attendance at the CNA conference, and in particular, as we undertake Canada's largest infrastructure project in the major component replacement. Thank you. Yeah, sure, that's noted, and uh, I think that as part of our conference um, attendance policy, uh, certainly members of council could choose to attend uh, CNA. Yep. So if there's nothing further on that, then we'll move us on to uh, item nine, the report of department heads, and we have five reports, uh, and um, we'll just go through them. I guess uh, first is the information report on the election survey results, and does the clerk have any comments with regard to that? No comments. Are there questions from members? Councillor Grace? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's not a question. Uh, I just wanted to thank Linda and 
uh, your staff for getting this survey out so quickly and uh, reporting the results and of course all your work on the election and um, it was the results were very interesting and and I think uh, we'll be it's useful to get that information right away and then keep it in store for when we get to that uh, reassessment stage and figuring out what we're going to do next time but thank you again read uh, comments uh, councillor Smith thank you and through you mayor uh, there were a number of interesting and innovative ideas suggested in the comments column, one in particular around uh, an incentive idea for folks who do choose to vote. Um, this is not unlike some disincentive programs that exist in the world, so certainly those, those things that we can do to increase our voter turnout, I certainly encourage us to do. Uh, however, the only part I didn't see much in the way of statistics showing satisfaction with those who visited the Help Center, and for someone who not only visited but also uh, used the telephone service it was a fantastic service and uh, job well done to all the staff as well further comments okay uh, then let's move on to item two the information report on the 2018 water reports uh, the director of infrastructure you have some comments Sure, and through you just quickly, these reports are statutory. We need to post them on the website and have them available at the front desk. So if you are asked about them, they're available in both formats, paper and digitally. Uh, again, we're proud to show the 100% score on the inspection this past year performed by Aqua. And if you have any questions, you can uh, feel free to reach out to either myself or Colin at any time. Comments or questions from members? Any? Again, uh, this is an outstanding uh, report 100% uh, uh, compliance rate which is out, which is excellent work and a reflection of the work of yourselves and of uh, your entire staff and of aqua as well and uh, um, certainly uh, can clearly be argued here that uh, we're operating a um, safe water system in Saugeen Shores and uh, that's what we want so thank you for that uh, that moves us then on to item 3 information report on health care in Saugeen Shores and the CAO Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and I'll, I'll just uh, be brief on this. I just wanted to give council and community an update. Um, I'm on the Physician Recruitment Committee and, and am now joined by Councillor Smith. Uh, our investment in health care continues in Saugeen Shores. We're an uh, enviable community to live and, and work, as uh, uh, people understand, um, and our investment in health care is paying off. We've had some challenges in the past, as, as uh, uh, our community will understand. When we've targeted things like our emergency room, uh, we're now fully staffed with emergency room doctors. We've been successful in, in recruiting um, uh, doctors, physicians specifically for the emergency room. When we recruit new doctors as well, we, we uh, have a requirement um, that they do also um, take emergency room shifts, so that's helping. Um, our orphan patient list is, is uh, down um, from what it has been historically, but is still at, at a, a, I would describe as a worrisome number. Staff are continuing to work uh, to, to uh, focus our energies on access, and uh, that'll be a, a key word going forward. We want to increase access to healthcare for our, our residents as well for visitors, and uh, we want to make sure that that um, um, that orphan patient list number gets lower and our access increases. So we're working with other stakeholders and the physician recruitment committee, uh, which includes local doctors, and uh, hope to report back some future successes. Questions or comments of the CAO? Councillor Smith. Thank you, and through you, Mayor. Uh, as a newly appointed member of the Physician Recruitment Committee and as someone who has resided in this community when our orphan patient lists were far exceeding what they are now, I can attest that the efforts that we have ongoing as community and community partners, as well as in cooperation with our corporate partners, they're certainly working. Uh, however, our work is certainly not done, as you attested to in the, uh, in the report. One of the items that's cited as a huge draw for our healthcare professionals is looking to our community to offer soft skills, so, or sorry, rather soft services, and this means access to recreational facilities and activities for themselves and their families in the community. Uh, so in addition to adequate housing and retail and professional services, as we as a, as a community continue to grow, we need to continue on to focus on those items that are appealing to potential physicians as well. Thank you. A few further questions or comments from members? Councillor Mayat. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Um, 
Mr. CAO, the, uh, the number sits around 400 for orphan patients. Is that just Soggy and Shores residents or does that take into a, a catchment area? Because I know our medical facilities serve not just people that live here, but surrounding communities, Paisley, Tiverton, uh, Hera, some of those people. And, those, and there's a, a number of those people who are orphaned also. Yeah, th uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that number only reflects people that, that are in Soggy and Shores, uh, and it only reflects people that have listed themselves or signed up for Healthcare Connect. We know there's uh, residents that have not elected to do that yet. Uh, we also know that uh, we have a great number of seasonal uh, residents who uh, live somewhere else and may have a physician there. When they come to town, they, they don't have a physician. Those, those are the groups that... that uh, um, there's limited access to. Uh, currently, they're restricted to the emergency room. So, uh, we want to help improve access for those people. In those other areas, can sign up for Healthcare Connect as well. Yes, that's true. They can. Further comments or questions? Being none, then that moves us on to the information report number four on the Lamont Sports Park terms of reference and the Director of Community Services. Thank you. This is a good news story and further to my report that I presented at last Committee of the Whole where I asked for formal uh, approval to move forward with the naming of the Lamont Sports Park. Uh, this phase is the completion of the consultation and creation of conceptual drawings and certainly will allow once completed staff to advance to the de detailed design and tender process for the construction phase. We're looking at a preferred uh, firming up the consultant by about the mid of May. That'll give us time to do, go through the recruitment process and uh, the decision-making process. And it's hope that anticipated um, that the document will be on our website this week. We'll be working with Treasury Department through that process. Thank you. Questions or comments for the Director? The Vice Deputy Mayor. A couple, couple of questions I have. In the um, terms of reference, you talk about um, deliverables. Right at the top, you talk about experience of landscape design, architectural background, which is good. Um, the, the landscape design is, I think, should be of interest to all of us in terms of um, canopy, uh, treeing, shading. Um, and you talk about not limited to in, in the deliverables, but there's really no mention in the deliverables from a landscape plan standpoint. And I'd like to see a line in there, Jane. I think it's important from, so we get, you know, accurate costing when we're out looking for, for pricing for a consultant for this, this job, um, that they don't overlook the fact that landscape is, is really important for the park. Because I think that, you know, when participants, um, spectators arrive at a, a ball, ball complex or a soccer complex, it's nice to be able to sit under a tree and, and have some shade and so, I just there's not a lot of mention in, in in the terms of reference about that, so I think that'd be a good addition from my standpoint, anyways. And the other question I had was, um, and I know it probably doesn't belong in here, but I, I, I question about fundraising, and I think it's you know it's this it it's not a uh, inexpensive project. It's a great great project that we've all been waiting for for a long time, and I know the ball community is very happy about it. Um, but you know, it comes with a high ticket price, and uh, so I think that it's important that the the cost, the capital cost, is driven down, you know, wherever possible, however we can do it, whether it's through uh, those grants that we've not been able to to be able to attract over the years, but we'll continue to try hard. Um, when do you see the, uh, the the fundraising component? Starting, I know it probably doesn't belong in here, but I see there's there's public there's community meetings with the with the participation group, which is a good thing. So when do you see the fundraising campaign kicking off for this ball complex? We'll wait until we see what comes through this phase, and at that point, we'll approach council with a determined approach for a fundraising campaign and what that will look like. But you do see a fundraising campaign. I think there's there's, there's people out in the community that are willing to, you know, to really get involved and, and head up campaign. You know, turn, try and raise that half million or million dollars, whatever it is. So. Yeah, our job will be to develop the approach that we want to take to garnering the funds for the project. But you do see a fundraising campaign. There'll certainly be something, yes. Further comments? Uh, Councillor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and once again through you. Uh, I, I see under Section B, uh, Community Consultation, which is an important component, obviously, uh, that you've got all the, the groups listed at the for the preliminary stage uh, consultation. So you've got... Minor ball, slow pitch, men's slow pitch, 
school representatives, Saugeen Rail Trail representatives, community at large, as well as municipal employees. Uh, where do you see council fitting into that program? We're, we're not specifically listed there, but my, my experience has been when they have these community consultations, you have the, the boards up there and you've got a artist concept A or artist concept B or artist concept C, and then the groups come in and they, they discuss and then they vote on A, B, or C. But at what point do we, we have a um, blank canvas put down in front of us and say, where do we want it to be, over on the west end or the east end, by the river, by the by the the pit head or at what point do we get a chance to say which is the best spot for the concepts to the initial concepts to be put down council will be part of that process we'll take the lead from our key stakeholders who are the users of the facilities but overall we'll take the lead from the consultant to determine at what point council will be part of the process I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm saying we'll take the lead from the consultant when at what point they prefer council to come on board. The well, CAO has a comment. I just want to comment one of the items in, in the terms of reference I was looking uh, through here. I didn't see it, but I believe it's still in here, is that the, the, uh, through the RFP process, uh, they are requested, Jane made sure that they uh, uh, include their consultation plan right within the RFP process. So we will be early in to be able to modify that or give feedback as required. The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you, um, this is one of the projects I've been waiting four years for. Uh, looking at the deliverables, Jane, um, three and four, review the existing ball facilities to determine their future considerations and developing a phased in approach. I thought council last last time you were here that before we decided whether it was a four six or eight uh, diamond construction that, that we would have a little consultation in on that um, I myself would prefer to get this community group started that that our CAO has been talking about to get the, the representatives of the town um, going before we get our, our uh, consultant in to get the input in for what they want what do we want it's like building a house I can build a house in phases I can I can ask all my buddies to do it. I do a little bit here and a little bit there, or do we do we do it all at once? So long-term pain, uh, sorry, long-term gain, short-term pain. Uh, do we, what do we need? Four, six, four. I don't think four will do it at the first part. And when we look at our, our existing diamonds that are there, what can we do? Uh, I believe the plan is to help offset some of the cost by repurposing these diamonds. So I'd really like to see this this one of these um, community groups started well before we get into the consultation phase, get them out there, ask them what they want, and bring that back to our consultants so he can have an idea of what I want. I don't want what the consultant wants. I want what the town wants. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The director. One of the things that I've used as a document in leading through this is a document that comprised, that was developed of the uh, previous uh, REACT committee that did develop um, an outline of of what they would like to see and that and that committee represented a number of individuals too you yourself I believe are part of that group too so we've used that as a basis so we have started that community consultation to determine what some of the community wanted um, from a committee perspective at that point so I hear what you say and we'll certainly take that into consideration to have the full board Deputy Mayor thank you I totally understand that Jane but this is one of those ones where um, our, our newly formed communities I think should be started very shortly because if we're looking at getting um, shaped the diamond shaped this year so that they can be seeded soldered, whatever it is so that we have the year or two to grow so that they're in good shape and ready to go as soon as possible I believe we really do need to get these user groups in and say okay what is it that you want not what the react committee said this is now where we get the nuts and bolts in baseball what do you want town what do you want what can we do Give us your, your master plan, and we go from there. But I don't believe that four at the moment is what we should be looking at. But when we get our committee going, I, I really like to be on that committee, so I'll, I'll say that right now. I'd like to be part of that committee when it comes out. Um, I look forward to this, but it, it's, there's a lot of input that needs to be brought in. I think we should get it sooner than later. I think it's important to remember that this, uh, what we're seeing here now is sort of an early step, right? We're seeing the terms of reference for a hiring process for the consultant. So we'll get back a, um, rec a, pro a proposals 
We'll get back a proposal from a consultant. We'll be able to see whether we like that proposal or not, and we'll get to decide whether we're going to hire them. Uh, and at that stage, we'll know what the process is, and, and we'll be able to make further determinations as to how we want to proceed. But so this is, uh, um, there's more to come. But I would also, I concur with the Deputy Mayor in that I th would, this is a prime opportunity for one of these uh, committees uh, in terms of our community committee structure that we're looking at structuring. Uh, this is a prime opportunity to get together a small group of people out of that team and say, look at this, work with our community services team uh, and, you know, bring us recommendations and help us design a great ball facility. Um, we want ultimately, as, as the Deputy Mayor rightly said, we want this to be a facility that represents the views or the desires of the community. Uh, um, and so um, we're going to have a lot of input points to uh, make sure that that happens and, uh, and um, looking forward to getting this out so we can get these, to these RFPs back so that we can get this person hired and get the project rolling. The Vice Deputy Mayor. I have one final comment. I, I, I agree, Count, uh, Deputy Mayor and Mayor. Uh, that, um, you know, the more community consultation, the better on this one. And, Jane, I think, you're, I mean, that, that's that's a given, I would I would think, and that we, we want to have as many people involved with this process as possible. Uh, when you say uh, the community groups involved but not limited to men's slow pitch, la lady slow pitch, minor ball, it's a given that when we hear about losing uh, beach volleyball space at the, at, at the Port Algon Beach, that's a given that, that beach volleyball is going to be part of the discussion and, and, and minor soccer will be part of the discussion. So that's probably that common word, but not limited to. There, there'll be lots of, lots of community involvement by more than slow pitch and, and baseball. Uh, I remind Council the Recreation Master Plan identified for an outdoor sports complex. So at this point, we're looking at baseball facilities. Um, the Recreation Master Plan did not identify soccer at, a, at an outdoor sports complex or volleyball at this point. Okay, uh, at, at the public consultation stages, I'm, I'm assuming that those groups may show up. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Anyone has an opportunity to show up during the community consultations. Yeah. I've merely identified those groups as those are ones that we will be sending personal invites to to ensure yeah. that their voices are heard. I believe around this council table there has been some discussion in the past about beach volleyball, you know, finding space somewhere to accommodate uh, that, that particular sport because we're losing space down there, obviously. So. Maybe an ideal location for two or four courts, so, but but the process will um, will look after that. Okay, uh, the deputy mayor. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jane, just one question: Why are we inviting the school board? School boards use our fields now at Cameron Park. And uh, we certainly want to hear their voice, uh, how it may impact their program. Um, if by chance Cameron Park no longer exists through this process, then will they still continue or will they continue or start to use a, a new uh, sports complex, uh, baseball fields at this location? Did we look at them about the pool as well? Because the moving of the pool drastically in, uh, impacts their Z program. Were they consulted in that? Any groups, all groups and individuals for consultant through the pool if they wanted to be part of that voice. Councilor Schreider. Um, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so on the deliverables number five, for example, costing analysis of the construction phase through a phased-in construction approach, um, when we had talked about this around budget time, I think that we had talked about that hopefully this RFP would come back with recommendations from the consultant regarding do we do it in a phased-in approach or should we do it all at once. But I don't read it this way, so I'm just wondering if that still is the intent, is that they will actually provide us with recommendations or best options for looking forward for the full development of this park. There is reference in here that talks about the phased in approach and the costing for that. That's what is that what you're asking me? <laughs> uh, yes, but also I, I think when we talked about it at budget was that will this consultant be able to come back with us for costing for doing the whole park, like all the ball diamonds? It, it's at certainly once. a cost that we can ask them for if you're asking me for ball diamonds and amenities all at once. Um, it may be cost prohibitive, but actually I can get those costs from him at today's rates. Right. Councilor Matt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I hate to beat a, a dead horse, but when we talk about the consultation, community consul consultation, um, what could possibly the Soggy and Rail Trail Association bring to the Recreation Master Plan? 
Because they weren't, we weren't identifying that site as for trails. To, to the recreation master plan well, no, or this plan? You said that the, this plan, the recommendation from the recreation master plan for this site was not to add soccer fields and beach volleyball. I don't think it was to add more rail trail either. So the reason why we have rail trail on here is because it will become a linkage to that area. So their input will be desirable when we're looking at planning and how that can be linked to the rail trail. Because it's in proximity to the trail? Correct. Okay, is, if there's nothing further on that, uh, for your discussion on that, then we'll move on to the fifth and final item, the information report on building permit activity in 2018, and the acting uh, uh, chief building official, Josh Plantz, has the report. Mr. Mayor, um, I, Phil sends his regrets. He's on a much-deserved vacation, so I'm here to present the uh, building numbers for 2018. Um, pleased to present them. They're very strong building numbers this year. Um, based on inquiries, and in um, we anticipate 2009 to be another strong year. So. Good. Yeah. No. There's. Uh, there's no question. I've been quoting this number to groups for the last couple of weeks. This 96 million dollar number, and usually it draws gasps from the room because it really is a significant number and a, what a 25 percent increase uh, over 2018 or 17. So uh, really, um, you know, a significant amount of growth happening. Is there questions or comments from the members, Councilor Mayet? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and and I, I concur. It is a an astounding number, hundred almost a hundred million dollars, and, and I imagine a, a great deal of that is uh, well, I mean, all of it is the cost of building of all the buildings that are being constructed in town, and uh, and certainly anybody who's gone through a building process knows that a considerable portion of that is labor. You're paying the, the tradespeople to. The, the formers and the carpenters and all those people to come in and do the work. So, so I think it's uh, it's worth noting that the economic impact that that has on our area to just house and and all those people making those good uh, trades wages in the town. It's uh, it's certainly a uh, often over overlooked but a con significant contributor to our our rapidly expanding economy here. Absolutely. Further questions or comments? Thank you very much, uh, Josh. Okay, so uh, that moves us on then to announcements by members, and we'll start with the Deputy Mayor. The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's been a very busy weekend in minor hockey and soggy shores, and I'm proud to announce that our Adam rep team and our Pee Wee rep team are both in the All Ontario OMHA B finals starting this coming weekend. I believe the Adams will be playing here on Saturday, and then next weekend we have a doubleheader Adams and Pee Wees back to back. So if you can, come on out and Pack the plex, support the kids. Uh, it's fantastic hockey, and uh, congratulations to those kids. And hopefully, we'll be able to bring them in here for a little congratulatory uh, celebration. Absolutely, do that. The vice deputy mayor, Councilor Schreider, Councilor Smith. I would just like to take a moment to recognize the Port Elgin Pumpkin Fest, who was the recipient of one of the top 100 events of the year by the Festival of Events in Ontario. Uh, this is a tremendous event that's been running for 33 years in our community on the backs of a number of volunteers. Uh, this event would not be what it is today without those individuals. So thanks for their continued support and that of our corporate partners as well. Thank you. Councilor Rich. Nothing. Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on Saturday, I attended the um, a Politician's Day, which is put on by the Bruce County uh, Federation of Agriculture and the Gray County Federation of Agriculture. It's a great day because um, from 10 to 3, they bring in a bunch of speakers who really touch on all facets of agribusiness in our counties. I just wanted to mention a couple of things um, that I thought that jumped out at me, a couple of facts. Um, Bruce County... Uh, consists of one million acres and farms make up a half a million acres of that. That's nine percent of all Ontario farms. Um, on the downside, uh, between 2011 and 2016, Bruce County experienced an overall loss of almost 25,000 acres used for farming activities. And um, Pat Gillison, who is uh, our local federation rep on the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, reported that province-wide we're losing 175 acres of farmland a day. Um, however, positively speaking in terms of economic impact, uh, the total farm cash receipts in Bruce County 
in 2017 was a bit over $508 million out of a total of uh, $12.7 billion in farm cash receipts from all Ontario farms. So that's, that's very significant. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that the Bruce County Federation of Agriculture is taking steps to uh, try to solve a couple of um, problems, particularly related to labor shortage uh, in agricultural business. Um, one is, is the labor shortage, and the other thing that they're trying to do is to attract young people uh, to get involved in agribusiness. And so uh, the, the Bruce County Federation of Agriculture offers bursaries to students who are entering or currently pursuing a post-secondary education with an emphasis on some relation to agriculture. Uh, and in the last year, um, they have awarded 16 bursaries, the last two years, I should say, they've awarded 16 bursaries of $1,000 each. So... Um, that's something to look for on the Bruce County Federation of Agriculture website if you're interested, and I hope our, our media will report that. It's, it's important for um, our young people to know about that opportunity. Thanks. Councillor Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Cheryl's, or Councillor Grace is a hard act to follow. But, uh, um, the last time I, I was asked to speak, I, I spoke about a significant member of our community, Jim Benj, who passed away. And unfortunately, this week I have to report on, and I don't mean to make this a uh, obituary session, but two significant individuals. The second one is um, Basil Eby, passed away last week unexpectedly, and uh, I went to his visitation on the weekend. He was also a founding member of the Lake Huron Fishing Club, and uh, obviously his father, Basil Sr., founded the B Eby's Barbershop, which is... Anybody who grew up or, or has lived here for any period of time has probably got any men anyway. We've got, probably got a haircut there, and uh, it's just uh, sad to see that another uh, significant and long-term member of our community has passed away. So I thought I'd mention that. And I was uh, I was at Basil's uh, funeral today, and it was a it was a nice service, and uh, that's the, they represent the longest-standing business in Port Elgin. Um, so that's uh, big loss. And the other big uh, the Port Elgin business community lost another. Uh, um, icon, I guess, this year, uh, this uh, last uh, couple of weeks, Ralph Hornsby, and uh, I was honored to be at his funeral and to uh, have the opportunity to say a few words at his funeral, and uh, um, both of those gentlemen uh, um, leave long legacies, you know, and I always think, here in, uh, being a business owner myself, the idea that uh, after you pass away, that your business continues to stand and function and operate once you're gone, uh, that's a huge achievement. You know, that's something that uh, few business owners, uh, few business owners get their business to last their whole life lifespan, let alone extend beyond their lifespan. And, uh, you know, those guys were lions of our business community, and they're going to be deeply missed. And the, final, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, um, is just a, uh, a shout-out, a kudos to the Socking Shores Fire Department, who uh, responded today to a fire in King Carden, uh, on the main street in King Carden. That uh, cooperation uh, between our communities uh, is something that benefits us all, and it's a huge amount of work and a major commitment for our volunteer firefighters to make their way down there and do that work. Uh, and uh, so we appreciate their work uh, very much, uh, keeping all of us and our neighbors safe. So with that, uh, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Rich. All in favour? We are adjourned. We'll reconvene at uh, around quarter to the hour. <laughs>